So as I've been doing on this podcast, I've been trying to uh, best I can demystify the uh, what I think is the founder experience. And I've been trying to bring to uh, all of you listening, founders of businesses, those who have successfully exited businesses, those who have started on the journey, people who are halfway through. So this week, I'm, I'm really excited to have, have my guest, Dave Oak. Dave, you know, as I like to do at the beginning of every episode, I'd love for you to, uh, to introduce yourself to everyone, please. Sure. Hey, I'm David Olk. I run a venture fund called Junction Venture Partners. We make seed stage investments in early stage companies, primarily in B2B vertical SaaS. Before Junction Venture Partners, I started two companies and was involved in a bunch of others. One was Vore, which is a networking business that is still going strong. And the other one was Shopkeep. Shopkeep is a cloud-based point of sale system, which you may recognize if you saw it in the wild. We started that company in 2010, raised about 200 million of venture and sold it in 2020. Prior to that, I started my career in public accounting of all things. I was in a mergers and acquisitions group at IA, at a PwC. So basically I gave financial and commercial enemas on the target companies of private equity clients. So if you were ever selling a business to Warburg Pincus, I was probably the last person you'd ever want to meet. My job was to destroy as much value as possible. And then I worked at in the mergers and acquisitions group at IAC, which is a consumer facing conglomerate of about 65 different assets, including Angie's List. We built Tinder. We own Match.com. When I was there, we owned Ticketmaster, the Home Shopping Network, City Search, Evite, Vimeo, things of that nature. My job was to buy businesses for them. While I was there, I met everybody in venture because the first thing we did was lever up four businesses, declare a dividend to ourselves and spin them off to the public. So I had about $4 billion of capital to deploy in 2008 while all the VCs were recycling capital. So even you know Yale and CalPERS were pulling money out of Sequoia in 2008. So I met everyone in venture pretty quickly. They'd come to our office. What do you want to buy? We're exiting businesses a little bit earlier on in the life cycle. I have an e-commerce business. I got an ad network. Met everyone in venture pretty quickly. That's when I joined the board of Kickstarter, which I, as an early non-operating board member, I helped them raise a little bit of capital. And in addition to this, I'm a active angel investor. I teach at Columbia occasionally entrepreneurship, and I like to hear myself speak to a captive audience. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> well, thanks for, uh, thanks for being with me and thanks for, uh, for uh, ahead of time for sharing your insights. So as I, as I understand it, the way you started, you got involved in Shopkeep is you met, you met Jason and Amy along the way. So how, how did that, how did that evolve? Oh, that's a great question. So Jason and Amy had a still have a grocery store in Fort Greene, Brooklyn called the Green Grapes. It's a specialty grocery store and they owned a bunch of coffee shops. And I think that they also owned a, a, a wine shop. You know, Jason, his biggest problem was his point of sale system. You know, point of sale, even today, it's a place where technology goes to die and the user interface is from like 1945. And the server would always go down for various reasons. He wasn't able to leave the store and Jason and Amy believed that a cloud-based point of sale system should be on the market. There wasn't one. So, you know, Jason decided to build what was the first cloud-based point of sale for retail. And then from there, we believe that the front end, instead of being on a PC, should be on an iPad. So we developed one of the first, if not the first, iPad cash register in 2011, which at the time was super compelling and differentiated. I joined the team because I had a deep background and network with the venture community and Amy and Jason wanted to still operate in the stores, which Amy decided to do in a very successful way. And Jason and I teamed up to run a software business that was spun out of the Green Graves. How did they find you or how did you find them? Because did you know much about point of sale before you got involved? Uh, in that's business? a great question. I know not. I knew nothing about point of sale at the time, but I knew how to raise capital, which is funny because the venture community at the time, you know, they they enjoyed the curation of having somebody that grew up in finance that had some M and A experience and would be a good partner for Jason, who was very strategic, very capable, but very technical. I don't, you know, I think if he was here, he would say he wasn't very interested in raising capital or, or running a business day to day at a detailed level. So we were a good yin and yang in that respect. But if I'm thinking about it, you're going from, presumably you're, you're making a salary, you're making probably a good salary. And so if you don't know, yeah. if you didn't know about the product, 
what, you know, how do you make well, that? that? That's a great question. So at IAC, we were always trying to perfect a local acquisition model. And what that means is we were selling software products and advertising products to local businesses. We had assets like City Search, Felix at one point, and even Evite. And the premise there would be having feet on the street, knocking on doors in order to sell to merchants a, a product. And that is a very upside down business from a unit economics and LTV to CAC perspective, because it's very expensive to acquire customers when you're knocking on doors through a direct sales force. And with Shopkeep, something very interesting happened where after we got our first few customers, these local merchants started coming to us. They would sign up for the product online. They would fill out our forms. They would download the app. And it was you know amazing to me to watch all of this inbound demand generation from the local merchant community, which is extraordinarily difficult and expensive to acquire historically. So when I saw all these local merchants coming to a software product, it rang a bell in my head saying, oh my God, we're onto something here. We can sell a software product to local merchants with different unit economics than what IAC was accustomed to. Plus, it was just such an exciting piece of software. And Jason and Amy built something that was so much better than what was on the market today from both the cost, customer service, and use case perspective that I, you know, I, I checked all my boxes for something that I wanted to become a part of, part of from the earliest stages. But it was a difficult and interesting transition. I, I had this now when I joined Shopkeep, I had this 12-year career that if not longer, where I was making very good money at a large corporate. And I went home one day to tell my ex-wife, hey, look, we're not going to be making any money for a while. And oh, by the way, I'm joining a startup. So she kind of got the bait and switch in that respect. And how does that conversation go? <laughs> well, I'm divorced. No, I'm just kidding. The, <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it, it was a difficult transition to go from having a salaried job with a lot of upside to all of a sudden, you know, trying to start your own company and partnering with someone that I had gotten to know for, you know, only four to six months. But, you know, to me, Jason and Amy were both geniuses. And I knew that with my help, we can build something important and scale it. So then when you come on, right, because you were, you were sharing, you knew you had something and you saw this business coming in the door, which made you more confident, but that was after the fact, you'd already made that decision. So I'm just trying to trying to capture the mindset of what gave you the confidence to make that to make that first decision to say, you know what, I'm going to join, I'm going to come along here, and I'm going to invest my my, you know, my efforts. In well, I, I just knew that server based point of sale, which was, you know, at the time, almost 100% of the market was going to go away. There was no doubt about it. cloud point of sale and a bundled SaaS solution to support it and essentially provide more technology to merchants so that they have a better operating system versus the systems that existed at the time, which were really just carrier of a payment product with kind of, you know, not the best user experience. I, I, you know, I just knew deep down inside that this massive market was going to be disrupted. I also knew that with me and Jason, you know, given the size of the market, even two knuckleheads could build a big enough business just because the market was so large and the appetite from the venture community to pick a leader in the space was there. And there was no doubt in my mind, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind whatsoever that between me and Jason, we can we can build a meaningful company if we just got out of our own way. Which probably wasn't easy at first, admittedly, if you're if you're if they're two people who are a team who've been working at this for a while and then you come on. I would imagine right there, there's the potential for some, uh, arguably a culture clash. Just, or just yeah, I mean, there, there, together. There, there was a culture clash. I mean, there was already two people that were working on it for quite some time and not getting a lot of traction with the venture community for various reasons. And I knew that if I came on and just work with Jason to raise a meaningful round of capital and just take on that role as operator, founder, you know, money manager and raiser that we would be able to, you know, get the business going. It was definitely a difficult initial few few months though, as Jason and Amy decided who was going to run the store, who was going to stay with the business, what my roles and responsibilities were going to be, who wanted to do what, and kind of how we were going to discern what features and functionalities to develop first. To your point, I didn't know much about point of sale. I learned a lot 
Jason still to this day remains the expert, but I, I was very good at raising capital and making the trains run on time. And that ultimately became my role. Was there ever a point in those first few months where there were questions about the ability to actually raise the capital, even though you had the confidence? Was there a question, you know, was there ever a question of actually it's not not happening as quickly as we would like or or something needs to change? The first round of the capital was definitely the hardest to raise. I mean, it took the, the most amount of time, but I had no doubt because I, I knew that someone would get it. Um, and, you know, we, we create, we, we had enough traction with early merchants so that we can support a meaningful seed round. And when the interest started coming in, at least initially to build an initial Peloton of people that were kind of investigating the company, I could tell from the feedback initially from some of our earliest investors that we were going to be able to get something done. It was just going to be a matter of time and how we approached the process. Um, but, uh, I'm very no retreat, no surrender when it comes to capital raising and I deal mm-hmm. with rejection well. So I almost always approach it as a volume game because there's lots of money out there and it's really just about finding the best financial partner more than anything else. And a lot of that comes with just hustle and never giving up and believing in what you're doing and, and really sticking to your guns that this is a key problem that needs to be solved and people will eventually see it. But that sounds that sounds a lot easier said than done because they imagine time is is your enemy, presumably for many businesses where you know they can have the idea and they can have the conviction, but if they don't, but if they don't find it in time, it might be too late. Well, we were fortunate in that from the earliest stages, the green grape stores and you know Jason and Amy's savings were really supporting what we were doing, and I wasn't taking a salary, so it uh, it made it easier. But time was certainly of the essence. We also hired a few employees because we didn't want to miss a window. So, you know, we definitely had cash burn. We had ways to support that cash burn. For instance, we would sell a lot of hardware. <laughs> Every time somebody, you know, bought the software product, we would sell them proprietary hardware like cash drawers, stands, payment swipers, things of that nature. And that helped keep the lights on a little bit until we until we raised that first round. I think a lot of folks see a company after an exit and they they see they see the the folks who built the business there's a perception that uh, founders are rock stars right that uh, success is just around the corner all you have to do on social media is start a business and you 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 know you're good i don't think there's enough appreciation for what it took from when you started to to when you sold it when you got the exit so you know if you if you are a listener how, how do you help convey the challenges that are building a business? I mean, there's so many challenges. I mean, starting a business is the hardest thing anybody could ever do by far. It's why, anybody why, could, why? Well, anybody could go get a job. And what, when you have a job, you have very clear, specific goals and, and you, you have a salary and you have different levels of stress, but you can pretty much, you know, you know if you have a, an, an educational background and if you have, you know, there, there's plenty of opportunities in this country for people to go get a job. It's harder to go start a business because what you need to do, especially your first time, is not that clear. Plus, you're, you're on an island, right? When, when you're founding a company, the four key tenets is to simply hire, inspire, retain, and never run out of money. And it takes a long time for founders to realize that because they get so deep into the day-to-day of everything that's going on around the business. And we could talk more about that later and how to scale as a founder. But starting the business itself and running the business, it takes, you know, Shopkeep took 30 years off my life. Things are not always going as you the way you want them to go. It's hard to recruit people. It's hard to raise money. It's hard for people to see the vision. Uh, you have to constantly repeat that vision to your employees so that they understand what they're working towards. Sometimes revenues are not always you know, trending up. Sometimes a business is flatlining. When you raise venture capital, you're setting a valuation well above what the company deserves so that the math works on dilution, but yet you don't necessarily have the revenue and the growth to support that valuation, at least not at first. So you're always chasing a valuation that you set in order to raise money in the first place, which is stressful because then at board meetings, you're pretty much talking about where you're spending money, why, how much is demand gen. And then you have employees to take care of and employees are are tough. You have to fire employees if they don't perform. You have to find new ones. When you're building a software product, you're going to, you know, you're always going to have competitors. We were operating in a hyper competitive space with a lot of well capitalized competitors. So that landscape was very difficult. And every day there's something new. You go to work and there's some fire drill 
you know, your head of product is walking off the job. Maybe you have a dysfunctional board member who's creating problems at, you know, of alignment around the, the, the top level of the company. Your head, of, your head of sales wants a raise or wants to change the commission structure or the goals. And, and that's just, you know, your, your people walk off the job. There's always things going on at startups, which make them very volatile and very difficult. And also, if you think about the general growth rate, if a startup is not growing, you know, three to six percent, sorry, three to six times a year, then it's probably a failure. And if you think about that in terms of a growth company, you know, if GE grows 5% a year, that was a massive year. So if you think about it on those terms of timing, like a week at a startup is the same as a month at any normal company, <laughs> just based purely on growth. I mean, I think we hired over a hundred people in, in 12 months. That alone is enough to, to you know, to, to make somebody's head skin. So how do you deal with that stress? Ah, how do you deal with that stress? I always found the best way to deal with that stress is with other founders. There's this concept of founder island, which you know is clear to me, and that is when when you when you are a founder of a company, you're kind of alone. You're alone because you can't really go home and tell your significant other how you're feeling because you know they get stressed out. You know they want to make sure that that things are okay. Uh, you can't tell your co-founders or your employees how you're feeling because they tend to need you know they need to be led. You know, customers want to return, vendors want to get paid, and your investors, they tend to be reactive. So you really don't have people to talk to, and, and, and you're always thinking about the business. You're always alone. Every time me or Jason would go to the bathroom, we'd have a big idea that we wanted to audible the engineering team with. And you're always thinking about the business. So I've always found the best way to cope with the ups and downs of, of starting a business is really two things. One, you know, to get off, to get off Founder Island, you want to hang out with other founders that are at the same stage as you because everyone's having the same problems. I always love talking to founders and hearing about what they're going through because they always think it's unique until you start talking about it on, you know, in, in similar terms of what of what you're dealing with. And and the other thing is to kind of find that earliest investor who's kind of in your boat now as the company has grown and and tend to rely on them even though they tend to be reactive. You know, there, there's you know, there's always an investor on a cap table that you can get drunk with and share how you're really feeling without them being reactive. I feel like that that just gave a lot of insight that a lot of folks probably don't want to share because it creates the it creates vulnerability and i'd imagine to if you're growing a business the last thing you want to portray is any sort of weakness or vulnerability because you have to be facing that everything's going great and that you know you're you're singing a great story all the time i don't know if that's necessarily true I think it's I, I think it's good to be vulnerable. I think it's good for leaders of start startups to say I don't know because it helps build build bonds with the organizations. I think as long as everyone's aligned, understands their goals, why they have those goals, and how it marries with the vision and strategy of the business, then you'll have a, a suitable culture. The last thing you want to do is lie to employees about what their equity means and why or why they have it or how the business is doing because people are smart. They understand what's going on. They talk. And if we if we were ever having a tough growth quarter month, people knew. It and, and, and you can present these things without it being doom and gloom. You could present them with, you know, here's what our goal is for the next quarter. And we, you know, we need to do better. Here's how we're going to do better. And you find that when people work at startups, they're charismatic in the first place. And they want to be the reason they're at a startup is because they want to, they want to show that their individual impact creates a lot of value and you can make a big ripple effect when, when you're at a startup. So for that reason, the people who join startups, they tend to want to be a part of it. And, you know, the, the reaction to things didn't go well this month or this year is not going to be a bad one. Typically, these are the type of employees who are like, OK, well, what are we going to do next year? How are we going to change what we're doing? What can we all do together as a team to better attack this market? And that's why I find that, you know, you, you'll find that the employee base of most startups are extraordinarily hardworking, charismatic people who are doing it for a reason. And it's because they want to be a part of something. And they and if you don't give them that transparency and alignment and sharing with with what's going on throughout the organization, then they get siloed very quickly and stop caring as much, which is why like doing all hands every week or at least once a month is important. And as the founder of the company, one of the things you eventually have to become in order to be successful is an information radiator. You know, the businesses, and, and you see that all the time with founders as the company starts to scale. Sometimes the founders don't because they can't pull themselves out of the weeds. 
And one of the most important things to do is to scale with the business by making sure that you're not making decisions that don't impact the company in three weeks and simply being an information radiator. So those employees understand what's going on, good or bad. To say it's a a roller coaster ride is 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 an understatement. So when you think about your own family and your own kids, what do you say about the entrepreneurial sort of journey and and what role it should or shouldn't play in their lives? Well, it's a good question. I mean, when I started Chalkeep, I had no wife, no kid, no mortgage. I can sit on a sp- I can wa- I can sit on a spreadsheet or perfect an investor deck until three in the morning. Nobody cared where I was or what I was doing, and that got progressively harder as the business got harder. We had our first child around the Series C, and since then, it became much harder to be as m- much of a part of the business as I wanted to because I wanted to go home. So, you know. Being an entre- you know, starting, you know, you know, being a part of Shopkeep definitely took like 30 years off my life, but it was, you know, 100 MBAs in one. And I, I wouldn't, you know, the family dynamic wasn't the hardest part because I had such young children. Well, one young child at the time. I just wanted to get home sooner. And when I got home, I had to shut down. That's what made it harder. So if you're starting a business today and you have children and people that depend on you and they demand your time and your presence, and when you're home, being present when you're home, which is hard, then you just have to get a lot better at saying no to things. I find a lot of founders are not very good at managing their time. They get unfocused. They get distracted. They chase shiny objects. They start pitching everybody. They go to every networking event they can. They get on planes and go to panels when really they should just be focused on, you know, the priorities of the business and dumbing it down to three things. And, you know, when you have a family at home, it, it really drives that that home, that, that, that element of just making sure you're focused because, you know, it's hard enough to start a company. It's even harder to do it if you have a family at home. And, and what about for and what about for them for their for their futures? Would you point them in the in in the direction of you know an entrepreneurial role, a, a founder starting a business? Sure. I mean, if my children wanted to start businesses, I, I I would I would definitely point them towards it. But I would make sure that they have the personality for it. And what's right? that personality? Well, you know, founders definitely tend to skew towards being filled with hustle being able to dilute the noise that are around them, ha- having a, a determination, like no, no fear of rejection. And the really good founders, and this is a development point that I have, are not emotional. They tend to be pragmatic. They can suck all the emotion out of the room and really lead a team. And they're able to identify the direction to lead a group of people. And, 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 they're, you know, and, and they're very good at being collaborative in nature while being able to make decisions at the same time. And there's a lot of people out there that, that that are not good at that, that don't have the mentality to fail over and over and over again. And when you're running a startup, you basically just fail forward. There, there's no such things about of failed entrepreneurs. They're just learned entrepreneurs, which is what Steve Blank says. And you know, being a good founder is really all about pivoting, learning, user discovery, managing a team, pulling yourself out of things, hiring the best people, never running out of money. And that takes a lot of hustle and it takes a lot of long hours. A lot of people say to me that they want to join a startup because they don't have, you know, or they want to start a business because they don't want to have a boss anymore, which is the most absurd thing because you have more stakeholders than you could ever imagine when you start a company. And not to mention you have to return the capital sometimes, you know, especially early stage capital, you got to return that 20X. You have investors, you have employees, you have customers, you have vendors, you have board members you have so many more stakeholders when you start you have more bosses than you could ever imagine so that that that's not a reason to start a business a reason to start a business is because you feel like you're going to solve a massive problem that you you just can't live the rest of your life without solving and two you know you're you you have the personal emotional makeup to fail over and over again and and one thing i also like to say is the reason why i started shopkeep or or became a the, the reason i decided to become a big part of shopkeep even though I had a big job, was because I, I knew I could always make money. I knew I could always feed my eventual family. You know, I had a Columbia MBA and I made decent money. So I knew I could always make money, but I knew that I was at a point in my life where it's really hard to build equity value in something. And that's unique. The opportunity to build equity value into some in something versus just having a job, you know, if if you have that feeling inside, it doesn't hurt to take that leap. Because worst case scenario, you could just get a job. <laughs> well, well, what's interesting is 
you're the product of two teachers, right? Two educators, where they were just the, you know, I, and I'm the product of two teachers. So yeah. uh, I know the salary and the pension, right? So that yeah. arguably that's the, that's the risk averse, right? Path. So yeah, well, my parents were Brooklyn high school teachers at FDR high school in, in South Brooklyn and Bensonhurst. So they you must know. have said you're crazy. They must have said, Dave, you're crazy to be leaving a salary. I mean, taking, you know. well, I also, I also had a different perspective of life. I, you know, I would, I didn't grow up going to the Hamptons, you know, my, you know, my dad's not an LP in a venture fund or my mom's not an LP in some fund. You know, I, I didn't start the business because I have so much to fall back on. I started it for opposite reasons, which is I felt like I was already successful, quite frankly. I mean, I started working at Arthur Anderson in 1998 and I made $41,000 a year. I thought I won the freaking lottery, right? So right. I, I, I was, you know, pretty happy with my resume, for that reason, I, I always set reasonable goals for myself. I, I never, you know, I didn't think in terms of millions and, you know, I, 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 I didn't think in those terms. I, I always thought in terms of what do I want to do with myself? You know, what's enjoyable? You know, I, I've had this initial great experience. I never thought about my career, my career as, as kind of linear in nature. Like I always wanted to make partner at PwC when I was there, but it wasn't the end all be all of my life. And I, I just always kept my eyes open for other opportunities and things that I wanted to do because I knew I had my whole life to live. Like right now I'm 46. I just started a venture fund. So I'm on the third stage of my career. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been. It sounds like you're 46, but actually you're 76. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, you know, I, I, I've never been in venture before. I've been on the other side of it. I, you know, we've raised so much money and I have so many friends that are in venture and I'm an LP in a bunch of venture funds that I kind of know how they work, but I'm starting a new business again. But, it, you know, so, you know, I just feel like every every 10 to 15 years, it's it's good to reinvent yourself and find things that you enjoy doing or or, or at least try something new if you feel like you haven't hit your stride wherever you are. Uh, and failing is OK. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with failing. I constantly fail. But if you keep hustling, it's how you learn. But that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people to actually capture. Right. I think a lot of people go on, go go in with this idea that it's probably well, what's what do you think is the biggest misconception? You had shared earlier that, uh, that a lot of people go go be, start a business because they think they don't want to be their own boss. So is that also the biggest misconception that that uh, that you run your own life if you are a founder? Is that what is the biggest misconception? I think the biggest misconception is I'm just going to raise some capital and then this is going to be easy, right? Like you're basically once you raise that seed round or a Series A round, it's still the first inning, right? You have to return that capital, so it is a long roller coaster journey. I think a lot of people read too much TechCrunch and they think that every startup raises 50 million on a you know $400 million valuation and sells the company for over a billion. That is very unique. A $100 million business is very, very unique. So if you start, you know, if you do venture to start a venture backed startup, the odds of success are very, very, very low. And you have to go in knowing that founders aren't like that by their nature. They're passionate and they know that they're never going to fail, which is what makes them great. But also that there's this massive mis to your point a misconception that you, uh, everyone who starts something comes out comes out great and multiples on what their investment was or or yeah and again like just to be clear starting a company is the single hardest thing I could imagine anyone doing. You said something earlier which was it took thirty years off of your life. I'm sure an exaggeration, but but why? Because you're never not. You always think you're always thinking about it, right? You're always. Yeah, you're, you're, I mean, you're 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 never not working when you're running, when you're founding a business. You're always at work, even when you try to shut down and put your phone in a drawer when you get home. You're always working. You're always thinking about it. You're always trying to close a strategic partnership, hire an important employee, manage or cultivate a board member who might have a different opinion than you, or is aligned, and you're just trying to execute on a strategy. You're certainly maybe trying not to run out of money, or there's always something bad happening. People, you know, like I mentioned, people walking off the job, major customers churning, you know, and it, and it just you get doesn't- it all, You're getting it from all ends. And it just doesn't end. Right. It's every day. Right. You know, every day, there's just a constant flywheel of shit spinning and happening. And sometimes it's spinning and you're just getting sprayed with all this shit all the time. And you're like, oh. but, but sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes things are going smoothly and you get to celebrate the wins, which is what you should always be doing because they're few and far between at times. But not every business starts and it's just this massive rocket ship. You know, there were a lot of times where we, were, we had flat growth and we were floundering. 
And I was looking at this $200 million pref staff saying, oh, okay, maybe I need to go back to public accounting. I need to get a job soon. <laughs> That's real. That's yeah. real. If that company is in growth, and you talked about scaling, how to scale a business, and maybe we could talk about that later. So maybe that time's now. So love for you to to share some insights into what you see people doing wrong and how they can how they can you know what what a better path is yeah i think the thing that i see people doing the worst the most is not getting out of the way from a founder perspective founders by their nature when you start the company you're doing everything you're doing all the sales you're doing all the customer service you're even doing the coding many times and being able to pull yourself out of the job and hire functional area experts to replicate and be trained from what you did that you can trust is the most critical part of scaling. Founders don't pull themselves out of things. And I kind of really try to put operating into four buckets. You know, fa- you know, founders who are CEOs or senior operators of their companies really need to pull themselves out of things and set a long-term and short-term strategy. That's the first quadrant. They need to hire functional area experts who are going to execute on that strategy. They need to set goals for everyone in the organization, or at least uh, make sure that everyone in the organization has their goal through a, a hierarchy that works, that's providing leverage for the team. And that's quantifiable and quantitative goals that even goes down to the lowest person on the totem pole. And then the fourth thing they need to do is they need to manage their board. Growth stage companies, managing the board sometimes is the hardest thing. Sometimes 85% of their job becomes managing the board because they like to make big decisions on small pieces of data. So cultivating and making sure your investors that heavily impact the direction of the company have a complete understanding of what's going on at the company is extraordinarily important. And that becomes a bit of a time suck and distraction. But if you're able to scale yourself and pull yourself out of the day-to-day, again, like uh, I remember Duncan Grazer said to me, he was a CTO of Vore. He said to me once, David, if you're making a decision that impacts this company in less than three weeks, you probably should not be making that decision at this point. And that was him trying to tell me, get out of the weeds, right? Your job is to be an information radiator, to make sure we don't run out of capital, to hire, to inspire and retain people. You know, look under the hood, share with us some of those, uh, a mistake that uh, you made along the way, because here you are, we're fast forwarding, right? We're, we're getting you now where you've learned all of this because you've done it. You've, you've done it a bunch of times and and you've got you've got all of this life experience so it would be helpful to, uh, to hear from you a, a time you know an experience an event that sticks out in your mind where you where you did say oh shit you know I'm really I'm really scared or are we on to the you know did we make a, did we make a mistake did we do something wrong here well, I think at a high level, I think it comes down to for us, you know, one of the mistakes we might have made early on was was not setting pricing properly. I think we could have because we were adding so much value. I think we could have charged a lot more for our product. And I remember one day Jason said it's a lot easier to lower your prices than it is to raise them. So I think we didn't do enough price discovery out of the gate and enough user discovery on what people would be willing to pay and create a sophisticated matrix of what our pricing policy should be, you know, straight from the gate. So it took us a lot of time to eventually raise our prices to where they should have been. And, you know, and and then that was a bit of a slog. So I think we, we could have made better decisions early on with respect to pricing, but specific like, oh my God moments. I mean, there's so many of them. One that sticks out of me is we had a, a chain of spice stores customers and it was very early on in the business and we we were we were developing the features and functionality for quick serve restaurants and bars specialty retailer and full service restaurants and bars and we were going to provide them with a point to sale system and so a lot of the features and functionality decisions we made was if we're going to add a feature it was based on a lot of communication with this cohort of customers that we have and what their needs and just prioritizing their needs and then building things that are positively creative to all of them and then we had this chain of spice stores which was our first customer and they kind of treated us as a contract manufacturer. And we were so excited to get them because they were like, it was a big deal for us. They had like 15 locations. And it got to the point where I was, where we were on the phone with the CFO and the head of IT for this spice chain like three, four times a week. And they asked us for special colored buttons and they wanted specific things to happen just for them. 
And it got to the point where I had to get on the phone with the CFO and have a very difficult conversation, which was basically, we're not doing that anymore. You're going to get the same thing everybody else gets. And of course, they were meaningfully upset, as they should have been, because I think we might have underdelivered on promises we might have met in order to get that initial contract. And it got to the point where I had to basically, we had to part ways. Mm -hmm. And this was a company that was generating real monthly recurring revenue for us. And it was a real, oh, fuck moment, right? Like, okay, well, we're abandoning, we're abandoning our biggest customer. And we're focused on everybody else now. The other mistake we made, and I think people make this mistake a lot when they build software as a service solutions, is you know we tried to bundle too much and be too horizontal. Like I said earlier, we were building a software product for full service restaurants and bars, specialty retailers, quick serve restaurants, and you know coffee shops, right? That, that, that Those are four large industries, and I wish that we would have just focused a little bit more on just like specialty retail or just full service restaurants and bars and really put blinders on to, to the rest of the other, the, the horizontal, the, the, the rest of the verticals. But as you it, say, it's hard to not follow the shiny object. Yeah, and you wind up doing a lot of you wind up doing a lot of things badly. Plus, it puts a lot of strain on engineering and product because... You know, if you think about it, let, let's just say you have a million dollar, you know, let's just say you have $1.2 million in the bank and you have an engineering burn of a hundred grand a month. Well, guess what? That gives you 12 features if each one takes a month, right? So you have to pick what you're going to develop. Right. And you can't live in a world where you just tell your team you want everything, right? Because right. it doesn't work like that. So when you're trying to accomplish so much, it puts a lot of stress on a team and you wind up indeed chasing shiny objects and doing a lot of things badly. I think our product would have been a lot better if we would have just focused on one specific vertical and it still would have been a massive vertical. So the market would have been high enough, large enough. Change gears here for a moment, because I think you have a unique position right now, which is you were a source of capital, then you raised capital and now you are a source of capital in a different way. Yeah. So you've seen, so you've seen both sides of, you've seen both sides. Yeah, I've done, I've done, I've done corporate m and I've raised venture money and now I'm running a venture fund. So yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty accurate. I never thought of it like that. <laughs> you played in a different role in, in the corporate, in the corporate M&A world, but now that you are, you have a venture fund, what do you think founders don't know about the capital raising process or, or what can make them better as they go to raise capital, knowing what you know, I'm always shocked by how by how little time and effort founders put into telling their story and creating a sophisticated, if not, you know, a pitch deck that's going to generate a hand to pocket reflex. I'm also shocked how many times people reach out to me cold without a pitch deck. Pitch decks are important. Being able to tell your story in a concise way is important. Not reeking of desperation for money and making people think that you have a lot going on is, you know, when you run a process to raise capital, you have to show that you have your ducks in a row. There's a data room, that you're running a process, that there's other people interested, and that you're well rehearsed. And that the narrative that you give is so clean cut and rides alongside a deck that is helpful when the person first understands it so that you're successful. Most founders I've come across are really bad at raising capital. And I and I don't know if it's because they didn't grow up in banking or because a lot of times it's their first time through, but they put a lot less effort into it than, than, than they should be. And, and, and then at the same time, they always walk around saying, oh, this person didn't get it or this was a long distracting process. It doesn't always have to be. If somebody you're talking to doesn't get it, it's your fault. You have to spoon feed them. The other thing they don't realize is that sometimes VCs, they are making decisions based on valuation. I never really understood that. That was something that was always strange to me because, you know, what's the difference if you do, you know, let's just say you're doing a seed round. If you're doing two on six versus two on eight, I never really understood what was the difference of the $2 million uh, if you're building a $100 million business. But the reality is VCs are trying to solve for how much ownership they can get. And it, you know, if you're raising $20 million with, slide, with Slideware, it's going to be a, an arduous process. So you know, I, I think I, I, I've, I'm always shocked by how much founders 
you know, just focus on valuation because you're basically, you know, if you're raising $2 million on a $20 million valuation, you're giving yourself $2 million worth of time to support a $25, $30 million valuation so you can have an up round. And that, that, that's usually not a lot of time. So, you know, maybe you want to go raise, you know, two on 10, two on eight. <laughs> and just, you know, and you have fewer people saying it's too early. Right. I, you know, so I've learned a lot from being in venture. One is that venture is also hard. Sometimes you're just not into somebody. You're just not into them and you don't want to tell them that. And, you know, when you say no, you typically are moving on. You don't want to keep hearing from the founder. I know when I was raising capital, I never did that. If somebody passed, it was like, okay, great. Thanks for passing. I'm not going to continue to tell you about this. I don't know. I, I think that the biggest mistake that most founders make, though, is just not being prepared and not running a process and, you know, seeming like they're panhandling. If somebody, you know, when I raise capital and they say, how much are you trying to raise? My response is, oh, I'm going to raise $2 million. It looks like we're going to be making a decision in the next three weeks. We'd be delighted if you were involved because you're also involved in XYZ. Let me know if you want to dig in. Now that you're in, you're investing in companies and arguably, well, in, in seeds, right? Um, so you're getting early and you're involved in helping them. How do How do you help them by having these types of conversations? Are there resources that you point folks to, to help them tell their story better? For our portfolio companies, we spend a lot of time beating up their decks when they're out raising capital. So, you know, I spend a lot of time definitely marking up decks and sitting down with the founder because a deck is a piece of art. You're always working on it and it never ends. And, uh, you know, unlike art, it's not enjoyable for the artist. Most founders don't want to be spending the time doing it. And it's just arduous. I don't know. Like, I, I, I try not to be one of those VCs that has a lot of opinions about things I know nothing about. So typically, after we invest or while we're investing, it's more of a pull than a push. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to get uh, constant, you know, investor updates. I, I want you to call me when you need something. Um, like when you're head, you know, and, and that's where I spend most of my time. It's, it's with these reactive phone calls that I'm getting from one of our founders who knows that I might have lived through what they're living through. So it's like, oh, that head of product walks off the job. What do I do? Or David, I'm hiring somebody. Who do you know? Or what should I do with this particular strategic partner? Or, hey, you know, Toast just reached out and they want to, you know, they're looking to maybe acquire us and they just gave me an information request list of 30 items. What do I do? Right. And, uh, you know, you, you've kind of been through, you know, if you've been through that journey, you kind of know the answer because you might have fucked it up as well. So, you know, you know, you, you know how to answer the question. And I think I think uh, former operators make really good VCs at the early stage for that reason, because, you know, you've kind of been through it and you can be a good player mentor coach to the person that's going through it with it. But you also know not to be annoying. You don't want to be the overbearing investor. Uh, you, you know, you don't want to make people spend time catering to your needs ever. That's something that bad investors do. They don't realize just how time consuming it is to respond to investors. But um, that's your value. Part of your value proposition now in your role is the fact that you bring this wealth of experience over all these years. I mean, I would think so. I, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But, you know, investors could be annoying, man. You know, they can investors. I see it all the time. They destroy a lot of value at their companies by just constantly distracting the, the founder. I mean, so mo most of the time, founders just need to be left the fuck alone so that they can operate without distraction. Well, we've taken up enough of your time. So I really appreciate all the time that you have given me. Oh, it's my uh, pleasure. And us a as we, you know, as we wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to share or you think that I may have missed that it's important for, uh, for folks to know? Yeah. If you're starting a vertical SaaS company, that's B2B in nature, send it to do at junctionvp.com. <laughs> and we'll leave it there. And we'll leave it there. <laughs> Dave, thanks so much. No, this was a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me.